Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at Dallas Theological Seminary and at the Hendricks Center. Uh, in Dallas. And my guest today is David Geisler, president of Norm Geisler International Ministries. And we'll explain the name change in just a second for those of you who don't know history, but it'll be transparent once we do it. And is adjunct professor at Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Veritas International University in Southern California. And he's been teaching what he calls practical apologetics for, for a long time. So I, I can't imagine in some ways having a better guest who on the one hand deals with the substance of what apologetics is on the other hand and wrestles with the question of, all right, how do we do this on the other? So David, thanks for being with us on the table. Hey, Daryl. Great to be with you today. So uh, my standard question, it's kind of like the equivalent of a baptism for this podcast, is um, how did a nice guy like you get into a gig like this? And I guess we've got to uh, explain, you're David Geisler, but you're president of Norm Geisler International Ministry. So let's put that together for people who may be young and may not know who your dad is. Yeah, my father is considered the grandfather of classical apologetics. Classical apologetics is what's called two-step apologetics, where you establish the worldview of theism and then you look at the evidence. So it would be different than, say, an evidentialist who would say, basically, you just look at the evidence for uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that proves that Christianity is true. Or a classical apologist would say, well, once you have established that a theistic God exists, then looking at the evidence does prove that Jesus is the Messiah. So your dad, let's talk about him for a little bit, was was trained, I think, in philosophy as well as in Christian theology. Is that is that a fair representation of, of him? Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, I don't know if, uh, if our audience knows the story, but my father was uh, practically illiterate till he was 17 years old, became a Christian, and then took 20 years to educate himself and got a PhD in philosophy. And uh, we, as you know, we made this movie about his life, Norm Geisler, the movie.com. Uh, just as a resource for the church. Yeah, and I've seen it, and it's a fascinating walk through your dad's life, and there are things in there that I didn't know about him, even though we were colleagues overlapping for several years when he was here at Dallas. Um, uh, and, and his background was, the other thing that's unusual about the philosophical depth of what your dad brought to his apologetics was he was very well... Um, schooled, I think would be the way to say it, or very uh, well informed on kind of the Catholic philosophical tradition. Is that in, in that right? Yes. And one of the things that, that Richard Howe brings out in the movie is that my father took the philosophy of uh, Thomas Aquinas and applied it to Protestant thought. And he impacted a whole generation of Christian leaders. Um, and yeah, kind of helped us to see that we don't just have to start with the Bible as the Word of God, that we can use general revelation and talk about truth and uh, help people to see there's good evidence that God exists. Um, because if God exists and miracles are possible, then you can look at the New Testament and see what Jesus claimed and Jesus proved. And, and therefore conclude that Jesus is God. So one of the places where evidentialists and classic uh, apologists overlap is in the area where they say, um, we can we can use and think about the way God works in general in the world itself and in general revelation as a whole. We can think about the way we should think about science in a in a way that integrates science and faith. That's in a way that's healthy as opposed to being combative. Those kinds of those kinds of ideas. Uh, it seems to me. And contrast. Let me just contrast that to say the presuppositionalist who simply says you presuppose 
shows that the everything the Bible says is true, and you don't go the, down the evidentiary path, and you don't go down the classical apologist path, because because then you're trying to prove the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God, so you shouldn't be trying to do anything to buttress it up. That's the more presuppositional approach. Um, but the more important point that I'm trying to make right now is the way in which you integrate um, what's going on within the Bible and set that in a frame that makes sense out of the whole of reality that God right. has created. And, and this is exactly what the Apostle Paul did in Romans chapter 1. He he basically helped, helped them to to see that we can know just from what God created that there is a intelligent creator who is all powerful and we can know a lot about his attributes and we can use those as bridges. When my father first started out his spiritual journey uh, in the 50s and 60s, he learned three things. He learned that all truth is God's truth that faith and reason are more compatible than even most Christians realize, and that there is an appropriate way to use apologetics in our witness to others. And he taught me and a number of people those simple principles, and they're really life-changing. It's really helped uh, my ministry over the years. I I was a missionary in Asia for uh, uh, several years, and and it was a missionary here, and it and it's really helped to have these resources that so when people bring objections or they have trouble just accepting the Bible as the Word of God, um, we have recourse. Uh, we don't have to stop there. We can uh, help build that common ground with people and help them to see that the Bible can be trusted. Yeah, you know, I, I I did not grow up in a Christian home. I came to the Lord between my freshman and sophomore year in college um, at the University of Texas in Austin, believe it or not, through, um, through, the, through the witness of several believers. But one of the first apologetic works I came across when I was thinking in the area of biblical studies was a general introduction to the Bible that your dad did with Bill Nix. And Bill who lived in the Dallas area for a long time. He and I used to go to lunch regularly uh, when I was on faculty here and and just interact with the contents of that book, et cetera. So in some ways, it, it laid a foundation for me in terms of thinking through the truthfulness of the Bible, the nature of the manuscript tradition, you know, the different kinds of issues that would come up in the Bible, et cetera. So really core foundational stuff that was that was important in, in getting um, a good solid base and orientation to what it is that the Bible is, and in some cases what it is that the Bible isn't, you know, and creating the right kinds of expectations for what's for what the text was attempting to do. Um, so, so yeah, and it and it and this kind of classical fusion between the role of philosophy in helping us think through worldview kinds of questions, and then the biblical studies technical stuff, which is where I've ended up, um, is, um, is an important combination. And I find that sometimes when we talk apologetics, at least in the popular realm, that people may have done a pretty good dip into the philosophical, classical side of apologetics, which is, you know, does God exist? What about the problem of evil, uh, the nature of suffering, those kinds of questions. But they tend not to be as deeply um, connected to the biblical studies. Why can I trust the Old Testament? What about the New Testament? That kind of thing, the particular problems that those raise, the resurrection in particular, you know, um, Jesus, historical Jesus questions, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and even programs that are designed nationally at schools are weighted more oftentimes on the philosophical side than they are on the biblical studies side. And, and so that introduction um, – was making a statement that I think was important in terms of connecting the philosophical worldview discussions with the nature of the Bible discussions, which were which are also an important part of apologetics. Yeah, and I, I think my father was in some ways a bridge um, to help people understand those two things, and that led, uh, of course, to the ICBI statement. That's where I was going next, so why don't you explain <laughs> what that is? Good. So the yeah. ICBI, tell people about the ICBI, because our younger listeners may not even know what that is. In a, 
International Council of Biblical Inerrancy, there were about 300 uh, scholars from all different denominations of the evangelical uh, community that got together in Chicago. Um, what year was that? 19... So I think the statement came out in 79. Am I right about that? Well, 79, and then, uh, then there, it also came out with another statement. There was a hermeneutical statement that came a few years later. Yeah, that, that the Bible is the Word of God. In, in the movie, I think one of the greatest lines in the whole movie by Josh McDowell is he, he would say something like this, if you let inerrancy slip, then every other doctrine in scripture will slip intellectually. And I just think it was just such a powerful uh, moment. And it really clearly communicated why inerrancy is so important that if we can't trust, you know, that the Bible is the word of God and, and uh, you know, essential matters, how can we, or in trivial matters, how can we trust it in essential matters? And, of course, the important part of the Chicago Statement, which was written out in articles, and then there were affirmations and denials that came with it, was it was trying to deal with um, – what I call the nitty gritty or granular nature of what it means to believe in inerrancy. So this is what inerrancy does mean. And again, this is what inerrancy does mean. This is what inerrancy doesn't mean. This is what inerrancy requires. This is what inerrancy doesn't require, which is really helpful in some of the areas certainly that I get to work in, which is um, which is what do you do with these gospel accounts when you put them side by side and there are these little differences in the way in the way of get described and worded are those really are those contradictions or are they complementary uh, accounts of the same event that kind of a problem and um, some of these articles in the Chicago statement are an attempt to be clear kind of about what the playing field is that you're on and because sometimes you can make the Bible do too much versus too little and, and get yourself into trouble by expecting things out of the Bible it isn't intending to do. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that, those conversations, which had a, a, a mixture of, of uh, philosophical and systematic theologians and biblical scholars as well, I mean, I think some of the other names that are associated with, I know Harold Hunter was very involved from our department. Uh, uh, I think Walt Kaiser was involved as an Old Testament person in that group. You had J.I. Packer, who was representing systematic theology in that area. James Boyce, who was a pastor who was trying to apply what was going on. So this really was quite a mix of, uh, of people who were, who were saying, when I say the Bible is the Word of God and I believe what it is that it's saying, this is what I mean uh, right. by well, this. And, and this was at a time, I don't know if, if you remember from the movie, that our culture was beginning to accept the idea that we can't even know reality. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, and there weren't enough Christians that were trained in philosophy to be able to respond to all the people that were making those kinds of statements. And I, I think personally, Daryl, that's why our, our, uh, the Christian culture kind of got run over uh, by the secular culture during that time, because there weren't enough of us, like my father, that were speaking philosophically to the wrong philosophy of our culture, and uh, it had implications um, in, in uh, the Christian church as well. And the other dimension of this conversation that was happening internally within some segments of evangelicalism was, you can believe the Bible, but you but it's infallible with with regard to matters of faith and practice. But the other right. stuff doesn't matter, and right. um, and 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 the attempt to make that kind of a distinction produced uh, produced internal inconsistencies for the faith that also had to be dealt with. So it was a it was a conversation that was taking place on multiple fronts in many ways. Right. Right. And then remember in our culture during the 60s through the 90s, this was a time when the Supreme Court had decided that you can't uh, talk about uh, a God, a uh, creator, creation, or God-given moral values in a public school. And my father, uh, you know, tried to play a part in that as well and get that turned around. And, and, and we lost that battle. Yeah. And, 
just think of what happened to our culture since then, since the nineties. So we've, we've gone even further and, uh, yeah, the hard, the, you know, the hard part of that conversation is is the fact that that um, we have a citizenry. You know, well, I'll, let me back up and say it this way, because um, I've written about this. Uh, Robert Novak, who's a very good cultural observer, um, said that our country was really built on two wings simultaneously. Think about an airplane, the Judeo-Christian values and, and, and net that wrapped around Western culture on the one hand, and principles of the Enlightenment on the other. And the Enlightenment principles had come out of a reaction to European conflict, religious conflict that had taken place over many centuries that created the space for religious liberty, for example, uh, you know, why you were trying to move away from a state-recognized religion and that kind of thing, which often was the case. But in going in that direction, it also opened up the idea of a person's religious beliefs whether they were religious or not, were a matter of their own conscience and their own personal decision created that space. And so Novak says it's two wings, but in the end, the design, rightly or wrongly, leans in the Enlightenment direction than it does in the Judeo-Christian net direction. And so we're getting, the, if I can say it, the natural outcome of that imbalance in what we're seeing in our culture. And, and uh, I mean, with, there are more skeptics and atheists today than, than ever before. Exactly. And uh, that's why apologetics is so important. Um, you know, that, that's what I'm trying to do with this movie. I'm trying to use this movie as a catalyst to awaken the church, because I told you about the three things that my father discovered when he first started his journey in the 50s and 60s, that all truth is God's truth. Faith and reason are compatible, and there's an appropriate way to use apologetics. I've discovered uh, just that people don't realize uh, these things. Like when I'm showing the movie in different places around the country, that even some pastors don't even understand that, as my father taught, there's a difference between belief that and belief in. Yep. That apologetics bears on the question of belief that, not on the question of belief in. That's a matter of the Holy Spirit. And that's actually what my father said the evidentialists and presuppositionalists are confused about. They're not making that clear distinction that evidence deals with belief that, but it's the Holy Spirit that works uh, on people's hearts. Okay, so, so we got, you, we're, we're at a segment here where I sure. can go one of two ways. So what I'm going to do is sure. I'm going to say the two ways so that we're sure to cover them both, and yet sure. at the same time, I want to go through those three core points because I think they're important. And yeah. then I want to come back and talk about, so our engagement in apologetics isn't just about our intellect in the end. There's more going on there. So, so those are the two places I want to go. So let's start with the three points. Uh, the first sure. is that all truth is God's truth. This alludes to something that we've already talked about a little bit, and that is that every sphere has something to offer if we think about it through a, 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 a godly worldview, I don't know, a Christian worldview, then, uh, you know, there, there are ways that philosophers and questions that philosophers ask that are worth probing from that, that exactly. point of view. Science the same way. Um, and Psychology. so, Right? Every field has some truth that we can learn something from and 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 put it within the, the Christian worldview context. So so just to put this in a theological frame, um, we could say it this way. Oftentimes this point is made, well, we're fallen creatures, so we can't read what's going on on the outside very well. But the flip side of that is that we're also made in the image of God, and we're hardwired to, to think in certain ways as human beings. I mean, most human beings, even if they aren't Christians, think that there is a spiritual world out there, that there's something more than us, those kinds of ideas, and that's coming from somewhere. Um, and when we apply um, a, a, a godly worldview or a biblical worldview to those kinds of questions, we can probe those areas 
positively. So I'm assuming that that's kind of what's underneath that first point, that all truth is God's truth. However God has made the world and the reality in which it functions, when we discover that, we're running into something that God has done and, and created. Yes, and, and, and also uh, with that, First Corinthians, uh, Corinthians 9.22, Paul said, I became all things to all men, so by all means I may save some. We can find common ground with with every non-believer. Um, we we just have to be sensitive to looking for those bridges that we have with people. Yeah, good. That's good. I, I, I'm tempted to go in a place, but I'm going to avoid the temptation because it'll knock us off course. Let's yeah. talk about the second one. What's the second principle that you said you, your dad had? That faith and reason are more compatible than most Christians realize. And here's... Here's what my father taught me, that um, I can trust God for the things I don't know because of what he's revealed to me that I do know. Okay, so this is is actually his pushback against any kind of anti-intellectualism in the church. Is that right? Yes, and showing how faith and reason can be more compatible, that we can still trust God for the things we don't know because of what he's revealed to us that we do know. For example, we can know from reason alone, Romans 1 says, that God exists, but we can't know from reason alone that God is a triune God, right. that he's a trinity. And that's where we take a step of faith. And so we need both general revelation and special revelation if you and I are going to be uh, Christians who can really uh, communicate well um, in in our culture, okay, the, the and yeah, and 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 the whole, I mean, everything about <laughs> everything about the way your dad pursued learning about philosophy in depth is a reflection, I think, of that commitment. Uh, he wanted to understand right. the way in which, both positively and negatively, by the way, you know, not just what not just what we got right, but some of the things we've dealt with that have that steer us off course and understanding where that comes from and what what the impact and effect of that is. I mean, it's one of the one of the advantages of of doing some good, solid historical philosophical work is the ability to spot those moves when they're made. I, I think I remember your dad, and this is a passage several people quote, but I remember your dad in particular quoting, you know, we take every thought captive. Uh, for Christ, and uh, and that's you know that was another principle that I think he would would have shared uh, regularly with students. Um, okay, so let's go to the third one. What's the third one? The third one is there's an appropriate way to use apologetics in our witness to others, and this is my specialty. Actually, I wrote a book with my father called Conversational Evangelism, where I just applied everything. He taught me about apologetics, and I applied it to the area of witnessing, and uh, that's what I've been doing for many, many years. Um, My father would say it this way. One of the first things he taught me is, you don't go to war with a pea shooter, but you don't go to target practice with a bazooka. Yeah. (laughs) Find what's, you know, the appropriate apologetic approach. I, I have a a new skeptical scholarly friend in the last few years. And after reading his book, um, I didn't argue with him. I actually sat and wept for Hmm. him. Hmm. I cried. And then I told him, I said, just want you to know that I don't think there's anything in your book that would keep you from trusting Christ. Hmm. And I just want you to know, I just sat and wept for you for about 10 minutes. Hmm. Hmm. See, and I think we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when to push forward and use all these great apologetic tools that my father and others have developed and be sensitive to know, you know, is there a moment that we can communicate something even more important than just a specific point that we're trying to make about the Christian faith. Okay, now you, you've now gone into a space that I think is so important for the church, I can hardly emphasize it enough, and that is that your engagement with people who are not a part of the church isn't just an intellectual exercise, it's a relational exercise, and that sometimes we err 
because we have all this stuff we want to communicate to people, but we don't necessarily give care to how we communicate right. it right. and the way in which we say it and how, how w- whether we've done any preparation to help the person be receptive for the kind of thing that we're going to say and that kind of, I, I, I often talk about when you're first getting to know someone, your first assignment is to get what I call a spiritual GPS reading on them. Right. What, how do they think in the spiritual realm? What are their values? What brought them there? Just let them tell their story. And you right. put your doctrinal meter on mute. Okay, you don't turn it off because you can't. But you put it on mute and you just you just let them tell their story, which actually opens up in relationally the opportunity for them to do the same with you down the road. So that's one of the benefits. And the other benefit is you might find out one, what their perception of Christianity is. Two, if there are any impediments to that understanding that they get in the way or that drive the way they're thinking about Christianity, etc. Again, another thing I'll say regularly is if someone has never darkened the door of a church, then their definition of Christianity is coming from one of two places or a combination. That is, the Christians that they know and or what they've heard in the culture about Christianity. How many of you want the definition of Christianity to be either of those two things? Yes. You know. But uh, when you said all that, it reminded me of John 16, 12. Remember when Jesus was speaking to his disciples at the end of his life, and he said something like this to them. He said, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And the yep. problem, Daryl, is we live in a world in which there are many things that we want to say to our non-believing friends today about Jesus. But unfortunately, there's only so much they can actually hear. So we need to be sensitive to how we use apologetics. So this is an art, and unfortunately, most of the apologists that I know um, aren't as sensitive in this area. And this is one area that I'm trying to help. Uh, the body of Christ. <laughs> I'm trying to help these apologists l- learn to be a little more sensitive of how they use apologetics. And, and especially since their primary barrier is not intellectual. Uh, scripture is very clear. Ephesians 4, 18, Jeremiah 17, 9, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Uh, Ephesians 4, 4 says, uh, the God of this world has blinded their minds. Ephesians 4, 18 says, uh, they are ignorant because of their hardness of heart. Um, if that's the case, then if intellectual barriers are never the primary barrier, then we should be sensitive, more sensitive to how we're using apologetics and don't whack people over the head with it, but use it to remove a barrier so that we can allow the Holy Spirit to begin to penetrate their heart. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's, there's, I tell people that, you know, again, I, I came to the Lord out of, out of an agnosticism. So I remember what it is to think as an un- unbeliever. And the intellectual objections, I think, are a shield to either mm-hmm. the emotional or will issues that really get in the way of embracing the gospel. Right. And, right. uh, and so, so, so that actually is an important observation that that connecting to the person at a at a level in which you build a, some sense of of trust for what you're going to say, and and this actually introduces a I, my definition of apologetics. This will sound strange, perhaps, but my definition of apologetics because we tend to think of it as the defense of the faith, but it also has this element: it's creating categories for people that they currently don't have. Oh, I like that. Okay, so you're so you're thinking about you're you're thinking about you know when uh, another way I like to say it is when you talk to an atheist or an agnostic and you say the Bible says or God says, okay, you need to recognize they have problems with both the words in that sentence. <laughs> you know, you 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 aren't communicating anything yet because you're on such different planes in terms of how you're evaluating what's in front of you. So now your job is to say, how can I create a category for them, or at least the open up towards a category that they currently don't have, so that they'll consider it when you say the Bible says or God says. How does that work? Yes. I say it this way, how can my heart accept what my mind rejects? Yep, 
Fair enough. And, uh, you know, you, you have to be sensitive to removing those intellectual barriers that people have. One of the things my father taught me, and I, I use a lot, uh, is this, that if you can believe the big miracles, you can believe the little miracles. So if you can believe that there's good evidence that there's an intelligent designer who created the universe, and he created the universe ex nihilo out of nothing. If he could do that miracle, you know, uh, Jesus' miracles are not a big deal. Yeah, and I like to joke in light of the James <laughs> Webb telescope and stuff like that, and that miracle gets bigger all the time, <laughs> you know? I mean, the more we understand how vast the creation is, the orderliness of it, the complexity of it, whether I'm thinking macro in terms of the totality of the universe or micro, what goes into making DNA work or something like that, and you sit there and say, that all happened by accident? Probably right. not, right. you know? <laughs> And this is how I combine apologetics and evangelism in our book, Conversational Evangelism. We talk about the five planks. So the five planks are, I'm accountable. See, if, if there is a God, then we're accountable in some way. You can't deny that. I'm accountable. I can't measure up. I'm a sinner. I need an outside source for help. And I need what only Jesus can give. And if we can kind of help people to understand Here's an evangelism element, but then put the apologetics at the very front so that people will understand there's evidence for intelligent creator, and it just makes our gospel presentation a little easier for people to swallow. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, the, the another version of the same argument is the idea if God can raise someone from the dead, then that that tells you he's got control over life, and life's pretty important to me given that I'm mortal. So, <laughs> you know, um, so uh, yeah, that's another way into the same space. It's uh, This is fun. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about 1 Peter 3 for a second, because this is a okay. core passage that uh, that comes up uh, regularly in apologetics. I tell people, I don't know of a memory verse system that doesn't have this verse in it somewhere, um, you know, that uh, set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you. And then the ending part, which some people don't quote when they quote the verse, is yet with gentleness and respect or gentleness and fear. I want to talk about three parts of that passage, the apologetics part to start off with, the idea that Peter, when he has to summarize what our faith is about, parks on the word hope. That's yeah. the one word that he chooses, which I think is extremely significant. And then last, the the um, tonal part of how we to do our how we're to do our engagement, which oftentimes gets ignored. So um, so yeah. let's start with the first one, apologetics. Tell what do you, what do you know about that word? <laughs> Well, you know, that comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a defense or reply. It's what a lawyer would do in a courtroom. He would defend his client. And uh, that's what we want to do. But um, I want to go beyond that because most people get afraid of that word. And so they don't do anything. I think uh, the command, it's an imperative. I think the command is more than just when people ask us questions we're to give answers, uh, we're to remove barriers, whether people ask us questions or not, because that's what the Apostle Paul did in Acts 17 at the Acropolis. He didn't wait for them to ask him questions. He removed barriers, whether they asked him a question or not. And I think sometimes the devil wants us to think that apologetics is answering questions that people ask us, so then we can say, nobody's asking me questions. I don't need to, I don't need to have answers. But then if you don't have answers, how can you have hope? How can you provide hope for people? Because if there's no one right answer, Daryl, how can there be any hope? My father taught me this principle. Um, um, a point in every direction is no point at all. Mm -hmm. If you embrace everything, you stand for what? Nothing. Yeah, uh, and I, pluralism cannot be true. Uh, we have hope because there is an answer. There's an answer, you know, for our sin problem. There's an answer for the transformation problem because the Bible teaches in Romans eight eleven 
that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to me so I can be a better father to my children, better husband to my wife, and uh, you know, better spiritual leader in my home. So it's a transformation uh, uh, issue that we need to help people to understand. It's not just he's forgiven us of our sins and so we have a ticket to heaven. Um, he wants to transform our lives and he wants to do it now and not wait till we get to heaven. Yep, and 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 going back to your observation about about it isn't just waiting till you get asked. I, I tell people if they will pay attention to the testimonies coming from people who didn't grow up in a Christian home, they will hear something consistently that they need to ponder, and it's this that somewhere in that testimony there will be the observation that goes, um, I met this person, whoever it is, a Christian, whose life was very different than the way I was living, and it made me curious. It met, it opened me up to thinking about the things of God, you know, mm-hmm. someone they worked with, a neighbor that they had, or whatever. And so it was this experiential, relational connection that opened the door. Remember we said apologetics was creating categories where they currently don't exist. Well, the first thing you got to do is get person to be open to th- categories they currently don't have. And that dimension of the testimony opens that up so so that how we conduct ourselves and even how we interact with people about our faith, whether whether they're engaged with us on the particular issue or they're just watching us from a distance, makes a lot of difference in terms of opening up the possibility of considering uh, who Christ is. I think my skeptical friend uh, was surprised that I cried for him, and I think that that was a powerful apologetic in his life. Yeah, I've heard numerous cases where per- a person's response to something is, well, can I pray for you? Yes. And they'll go, you know, prayer isn't a normal part of their life. So they're going, but they understand that that's, you just committed to, to intercede on my behalf, you know, and, and they connect to that. So there are these dimensions of, of engagement don't have anything to do with intellectual arguments of apologetics but have everything to do with opening people up so that they'll consider what it is that's being discussed. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's why there's a distinction between belief that and belief in, and we know it's the Holy Spirit that has to work on helping them to believe in Christ because, you know, the evidence alone won't do it. Yeah, I, the, the example of belief that versus belief in that immediately popped in my mind is, is what James says about about the devil. You know, the God, the devil believes that God is one, but he doesn't. Right. He doesn't believe in. Right. He doesn't believe the God who who's behind it. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have that faith commitment, that trust in who that one is. Exactly. So let's the, shift. Go ahead. Let's shift, shift uh, gears. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, uh, an illustration I used to explain this, I, I, I said, when I married my wife, Charlene, I believed that she would make a great wife based on the evidence. I would have never married her unless there was great evidence. But the evidence of why I thought she would make a great wife never forced me to say I do to her. That was a decision of my will. Yeah. In a similar way, that's what happens when we trust Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, the evidence for Christianity doesn't force us to uh, invite Christ to come in to be Lord of our life. Um, you know, my father would say it this way. In fact, in the movie, he talks about this, that, uh, that basically when you put your faith uh, uh, in something, you want to look and make sure there's an elevator. Uh, like if you walk in an elevator, make sure that there is a floor there. Before you walk in the <laughs> Better be a button to push. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so let's talk about hope for a second. Let me let me frame it this way. Um, I, I I really think that sometimes the church doesn't take the gospel as being good news um, seriously enough. And here's here's what I mean. We're so committed, and there's a reason for this, we're so committed to making people understand their need and their sin 
mm-hmm. that we forget the other half of the gospel message, which is there's a challenge on the one hand. This is why the cross was necessary because of your sin. But the other half of the cross is the life that's offered and the relationship that's offered on the other side. And the good news isn't merely that your sins are forgiven. The good news is the relationship you get to walk into. And Peter uses the word hope to make sure that the emphasis is on the right syllable, if I can say it that way. Yes. And 1 John 3, 2 says that when we see him, what? We will be like him. Mm -hmm. You know? That once we make that commitment to him, every day we take that step further to be more like Christ, you know? It's kind of like, remember that old commercial? I could have had a V8. It's like when we see Jesus, we're going to say, ah, this is what I should have been all along. I could have had a Savior. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, I I just think we underestimate in in the way we communicate whether whether the challenge and the sin and the problem is prominent or whether the hope and the abundant life offer is prominent. And I think if we don't take people to the landing place in when we share – we we risk cutting we, we risk cutting short or making the gospel too small right yes uh, i i totally agree with you that we need to help people to see you know it's just not a matter of christ forgiving you positionally your sin but he wants to make that transformation in your life and give you a hope in the future yep and, now, and, and there's a lot of people right now especially during COVID that feel very hopeless. That's exactly right. Yeah, and 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 the abundant life that's on offer from John ten is is tends not to be um, in view. Okay, let's turn to the last piece here, uh, which okay. is the, which is the tone piece directly, the concept of meekness and fear, or meekness and respect. Um, you did a nice job in a little piece that you sent me in preparation for this of talking about those two terms, prautitas and phobos. So, so tell us about those two terms. Yeah, well, uh, uh, if I can remember offhand, uh, meekness is more than just gentleness. Uh, uh, meekness is an inner disposition. Um, you know, we're, we're not trying to uh, assert ourselves. Well, we're not trying to win brownie points with the Lord. Yeah, there's a humility wrapped up in it. Yes, yeah, very much so. And and then the other word for fear, I like the word fear rather than uh, respect because, I mean, someday. Daryl, I'm going to get to heaven, and God's going to say, David, you had been discipled by these men in your life, including your father. What did you do with that? (laughs) Did you pass it on? (laughs) Did you make a difference? You know? Um, And so I see my life in in terms of that someday I'm going to be accountable to God for, for what I do in my life. And I think we need to keep that in our mind daily, that we are responsible, Daryl, as Christians. I get so tired of hearing all these stories of Christian men who are failing, uh, you know, their congregations. It's just, it's mind-blowing. Um, we shouldn't even be hearing these kinds of stories. Yeah, and 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 just to uh, this a little 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 pushback. In, okay. The reason I like respect is because in this particular case, I'm not talking about my relationship to God. I'm talking about my relationship and the way I'm interacting with other people. I'm not I'm not accountable to another person in the way I'm accountable okay. to God. Yes. So so but but it's I I think this word is important. Uh, well, let me say it this way. Sometimes in language, a word is used, mm-hmm. and in English, we make a differentiation when really there are two elements kind of combined together. And I, I, that's the way I think of this term. There, there's a, there, the reason I respect someone when I'm engaging with them, even if they're coming from a completely different point of view, is I'm respecting the fact that they're made in the image of God. And I'm right. respecting the fact that God has me in this conversation or in, has me relationally connected to this person bec- because I'm called to love them. And I'm called to respect the way in which God has made them. Yeah, and I so, like that. And, and so that's your that's your 
you know, your step towards somebody, if I can say it that way. And, and that's important because sometimes tonally um, we can be right but say it in the wrong way or in the wrong spirit or with the wrong edge. And actually what we're doing is we're not drawing the person towards, uh, towards what we're getting them to think about. We've actually pushed them away by the way that we've done it. It's so true. It's so true. And, uh, you know, if we would just uh, think about these things on a daily basis when we talk about how we're using apologetics, I think uh, we would make a lot more progress. Well, um, uh, I, I want to thank you. Our, our time is gone. I, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us and to kind of dive into this initial foray into apologetics and think about what apologetics is and the, the legacy of your dad. You know, like I said, he was a former colleague of mine for years and, um, and uh, had a impact in many organizations and and um, really help put apologetics in a, an important way uh, on the map uh, yeah. for evangelicals and to um, be able to sit and converse with you both about that legacy and your own work and your and, and what strikes me about your work and talking to you is this tonal piece that you have put your your kind of hands around is an important part because the tendency can be in apologetics to not be so tonally sensitive. So I really appreciate that about what you've shared. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah. And we thank you for being a part of the table and joining us. Hope you'll join us again soon. If you want to see other episodes of the table, you can do that at voice.dts.edu slash table podcast. Uh, we have a whole array of episodes on a whole array of topics because at the table we discuss issues of God and culture. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking that means we discuss anything and everything. We hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to the table podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.